It's so great to be here. It's so great to be here in such amazing company and to be talking about such important issues. So thank you all for joining us and thank you, panel. I, I just want to spend one second before I introduce the amazing people we'll be having this conversation with. I already know we need more time when we haven't even started yet. Uh, so I apologize for that, but, but you're going to buy the book. You're going to engage in the concept of uh, minimizing waste in, in food, in, in your lives, and also in the important role that chefs play in our, in our world today in food issues, but even um, in becoming advocates for food system change and other policy matters. And those are our major themes. Uh, we have a lot to get to, and so uh, if you'll allow me, I'll introduce the panelists and then we'll just get right into it. To the far right, we've got Fabio Perasecoli, who was the director of um, the Food Studies Program at the New School and is a, on his way to become a professor at the Food Studies Program at New York University. Uh, he's got all the food studies there, author of several great books and an expert on food and popular culture. Um, and um, I think the importance, I think, of, of food in our culture. To my right, Daniel Hum, a person who, to a food audience, needs no introduction. He's the chef and co-owner of Eleven Madison Park, um, chosen this year as the number one restaurant in the world, um, which is, uh, and yes, you get some applause for that. Uh, also a multiple James Beard Award winner, we must say. To my left, Catherine Garcia, who is the commissioner uh, of sanitation for the city of New York City, the largest single municipal waste management program in the world. Thank you for being here. Danny Bowen from uh, Mission Chinese and also uh, written author of uh, some great books and who, yes, an apl applause, who's here because of his role in many, in many of our lives but also in the movie Wasted, which we'll talk about. And on my far left, the person, the friends, um, the man who, of whom we are all friends and whose, whose vision really is why we're here having this conversation and why people around the world are having this conversation in a significant way, Massimo Bottura. <laughs> Yes, uh, just before this guy, his was the number one restaurant in the world in Modena. <laughs> you can't swing a cat without hitting a number one restaurant in the world on the stage at the moment. Um, and also, more to the point, author of Bread is Gold, which is the story of the Refettorio Ambrosiano, which has blossomed into a worldwide movement to come to engage with chefs and uh, artists and designers and all sorts of cultural uh, influencers to combat the issue of food waste and really much, much more. And we'll talk all about that. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> So I'm going to start, I like to warm up everybody on a panel um, with a question, and I, th this evening, I cooked dinner using some food that I brought back from a trip I was in Florida, and it was going to rot in the fridge in the hotel where we were staying, and I thought, eh, I'm going to throw it all in pasta. And I want to ask each of you, in this week, is there something you've wasted that, that bothers you, that something you threw away that you would have used, something that, that rotted in your fridge or that, that you w saw in the kitchen that you would have wanted someone to use? Anything. You can say no. Mm. No. No. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but mainly because I haven't actually shot oh, for maybe a <laughs> <soccer> <laughs> in a long no, I, I Maybe a soccer tart that I brought from Austria for my son, Charlie, that he loves chocolate. He tastes the soccer tart. He said, this is not good. <laughs> <I threw it laughs> and, and, uh, and uh, you know, no one wants that soccer tart. <laughs> so maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's bad in the refrigerator. Danny? Still Anyone? there. No. I can't think of anything. Good. OK. So we're already on your way to zero uh, landfill. You're a waste la in the landfill, right? We're, we're making some progress here. OK, let's begin, Massimo, by having you tell us a little bit of the story of the refettorio um, and the context in which it came to be, please. <coughs> it was uh, 2014, and uh, you know the Universal Exposition was there. Universal Exposition, you know, wow. It's a big thing, you know? And I thought... Uh, I always thought it was an, an amazing opportunity for Italy to show our history, what we were, what we are, what we will be. And, uh, but all the states, they were like, trying to involve me in a very strange situations like, okay, we have to do a part here in Emilia Romagna and we're gonna do like this. And without even asking us what I was, well, what I was thinking, you know, about uh, a theme like feed the planet. Wow. Which was the theme of the Yeah, the, the theme of the Universal Exposition. So I was talking about this theme uh, with Carlin Petrini confronting the, 
the president of the movement Slow Food, and uh, you know we were all both were like very, you know, uh, concerning about uh, what was going on, and blah blah blah. So I said, maybe, you know, checking the numbers, 860 million people they are starving, and 1.5 overweight and 1.3 billion tons of food are wasting every year, 33% of the world production, th it, th it doesn't make any sense to produce more. You have to waste less, you know? And uh, so we will start talking very deeply about these uh, things. And uh, I approached uh, many different organizations, but no one was interested in what I, was, uh, what, what I had to say. So I, at one point I, I went to to the Church of Milan, and uh, the Archbishop of Scola said, okay, let's listen. And, uh, you know, as, uh, as my usually, I'm a very passionate man and, uh, about what I believe. And um, at the end of the conversation, I explained my old project, and at the end of the conversation, he said, thank you very much, because uh, your energy, your passion is very, I can touch it, it's very, and, uh, and uh, he said, come back in one week. And uh, one week later, I went back to Milan. And uh, in my first idea uh, was uh, to reproduce a place better than uh, Leonardo da Vinci did 500 years ago, you know. We are modernists, we dream very big, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I said, uh, and, uh, Miracle in Milan could be something very interesting, like the 1950 movies from the Verismo Italiano, no? And uh, so under the train station in Milan, we already contact uh, Mor Moretti, the president of uh, Ferrovia dello Stato, the railroad, the blah, blah, blah. They, they said, yes, of course, we're going to give you the things, but we don't put any money, so you can do whatever you want in there. Uh, I said, oh, don't worry, we're going to raise the money. And... Uh, so the, the, the ch I went back to the archbishop and he said, uh, okay, it's fine, we're gonna do it. But uh, from Rome, you know, he consult with the Pope, uh, Francis, and the Pope said, uh, we, we don't wanna do it in, um, in downtown. We want to put the light and turn on the light in a periphery, you know, because this is the most important. Architecture, like the, the theater abandoned from, uh, we found this beautiful theater from 1930, abandoned since 15 years before, is the periphery of architecture. No art, nothing, just, uh, you know, dust and rats. In the most, in the poorest, in the neglected neighborhood in Milan, close to the house of the refugees, you know, in the moment, very critical moment uh, in Europe, because of, you know, all the migrants, and, um, and uh, serving the surplus from uh, Expo and the supermarket. There is the periphery of food, you know? So everything made sense, you know? And, and uh, you know, we did everything in one, uh, one year, involving the best architects, designer, um, uh, ar um, artist, because in, 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 uh, in my mind, you know, it was very important to create an amazing space. If Leonardo did 500 years ago, there was a meaning, you know. Beautiful space, beauty, beauty, fr through beauty, you can rebuild the dignity of the people. Why art, why design is just for rich people? Why? We have to do something better. You have to do something incredible. We have to open the door and say, welcome to every single one who was coming from the war, or from Libya, or from, you know, and, uh, and feed them. Because we are restaurateur, restaurant. Restaurant comes from the word reficere in Latin, will be restore, to restore the soul and the mind of the people that are traveling, uh, and that, that's what, what is the meaning. And so we did it. So you did and, uh, it. And you, you I call yeah. and I involve, uh, you know, I said immediately, I have uh, to have uh, all my friends uh, with me because uh, it's a, a collective project, because we have to share this kind of idea. I called them in 45 minutes, everyone said, we are in. So you turn this 
this, what became a beautiful space, was once a beautiful space, yes. into another beautiful space, yes. with tables designed by artists, with a beautiful kitchen lined with copper yes. on the hoods, all yes. this, this beauty, as you say. And you chose to invite some of the greatest chefs in the world to come reimagine the cast off food, waste or, or just overriped or unused or yes. and whatever, into a gastronomic feast for yes. the, the people of that neighborhood. Exactly. First course, second course, pasta, even, even uh, pasta and main course and dessert. Wow. And we were serving them. Right. But maybe for the first time in their life. You know, so they come to this gorgeous restaurant. They have Daniel Hum cooking dinner, and you yeah. he's then he's serving complaining them. for right. some people. They didn't want too, more many salts, too many uh, We want pasta. pasta yeah. Is overcooked. Uh, you know, <laughs> they became twenty-one <laughs> days, so three weeks. In three weeks, they became gastronomic Casper. Amazing. You know. <laughs> something. You might say something about the project is so Italian, but you're replicating it around the world. So something about it resonates, I think, with the human soul. I mm. want to ask you, Daniel, when Massimo called you first, you were the first chef to cook there. You were coming, actually, to cook at the James Beard restaurant in Milan. Um, what did you think? Did, what did you expect? And then what was the experience like? Well, for me, well, first of all, I think I want to, I've congratulated you in person, but I want to do it here on stage also, I think you deserve a huge congratulation uh, on, on this work. I think it's unbelievable what you have done. And um, you know, when I started cooking, it was, um, it was just you started cooking to have a craft. Mm -hmm. And then over the years, as we all experienced, there was this time of like the celebrity chefs. And you started in Switzerland. And I started okay. in Switzerland. And I think Massimo single-handedly changed um, from being a celebrity chef, now the chef actually have a voice. And I think you've, you've done that. Like now, now people are interested what chefs have to say, and I think chefs have a voice. And um, you have voiced that very strongly. And of course, um, when you called me, um, well, I would do anything for you anyway, <laughs> even, <laughs> if it, even if it would be <laughs> not such a great idea. But it happened to be a really good one. <laughs> so you arrive, I mean, let's just, I want to walk through this a little bit. You arrive in the restaurant. It's still probably <laughs> dusty and under construction, I think. And Almost. W what's it, what's that like? No, I think it's, in, it's really incredible. I yeah. mean, it's hard to really explain it until you see yeah. it. I mean, you see tables designed by the greatest furniture designers. You see murals on the wall by some of the greatest artists. Um, I mean, the place is, is a really is, is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. And um, to give that to people who have probably never experienced anything like it, uh, in addition to serving them a meal, a warm meal, but then also in addition to prepare these meals out of product that would be wasted. I mean, there's so many layers to this story. Right. Um, yeah, it's just unbelievable. Uh, fantastic. Fabio, I want to ask you about the, the cultural phenomenon of the chef rising as advocate in this space, because um, I, we have two, uh, three, pardon me, chef advocates uh, sitting here who, as, as Danielle said, s began to cook as a craft to make food to serve people. Um, happen to all be very good at it, but even if you're not, that's what you do. But something has changed in addition to Massimo's. Yes, definitely. S something maybe in the last 10 to 15 years. I think this is the reflection of a larger shift of food uh, becoming uh, an important part of conversations that we have daily. Maybe before, I mean, food has always been important, right? We all have to eat and the economics of it. But now it's an important part of how we imagine ourselves, how we think of ourselves. And because of the media, because of the um, sort of health issues around food, because of justice issues, because of the environment, there are so many reasons why recently food has become uh, an important part of the conversations in politics, social issues. Of course, chefs, in, in a way, embody, mm -hmm. you know, all that there is interesting about food, the creativity of it. And as food moves to the forefront of these discussions, chefs automatically find themselves at the forefront of the forefront. Mm -hmm. And I think they do play, you guys play 
a huge role because you can speak to the imagination of people. You can help them imagine other possibilities. But, but it hasn't been that long since they've been out of the kitchen, uh, th since they were yes. unseen, uh, right? Yes. A short period of time. Really, yes, before it, it, it was the restaurateur right. th that was important and the chef was a labor, you know, a worker. But th there this fascination wi with food and how food is prepared and where it comes from, uh, I think accompanied also the chefs in this new position. That started in the 60s, mm -hmm. right, with Nouvelle Cuisine, the fact that young chefs wanted to okay. put their signature on what they did, their ideas, but it's been a slow process. I think the acceleration happened more recently. You know, now you guys are in documentaries. That's amazing, if you think about it. Speaking of documentaries, Danny, um, I think in some ways uh, both Massimo and Danielle represent uh, a change from a very classic European tradition of cooking in the great restaurants and apprentissage and, and um, then evolving into this new space. But something about the way you got into this business, something about that first pop-up in a, in a divey Chinese restaurant in um, San Francisco already had an alternative vibe that was not just about cooking great food, although certainly the food was great, but was uh, something else was changing there. Can you speak to that or reflect on that a little bit? I mean, I got into food, you know, I grew up in Oklahoma, so, and I was adopted, so I'm Korean, but I grew up in Oklahoma with American parents, and, you know, like, I didn't grow up around food. Like, every night I ate, like, Hamburger Helper, if anyone here has had that. Raise your hand. Have you had that? Has anyone had that? So, yeah, it's like, it's like you would, I don't know what you would think of it. It's like, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's not like pasta, pasta, it's not pasta, ragu, ragu, but so it's like, it's like, you know, I, f I found myself through food. You know, I, I don't know, like, I don't know, did you want to be a chef as a kid? Did you know that's what you wanted to do? Or did you kind of, I just fell into it. I, I wasn't good at anything else. So I was like, well, I guess I'll give this a shot. And I ended up finding myself through that. And so, you know, like, I think as chefs, we all like a challenge. And we also always, we don't want to hit a ceiling ever, you know? So with Mission Chinese, when that started, I kind of had worked my way through restaurants. I didn't fit in to the chef culture at the time. I wasn't like a bro. I didn't watch football. And like, you know, I, I didn't, there wasn't a space for me. So I kind of created my own. And I think that that's what chefs do. Like we want a challenge. Like, you know, I, I, when you're asking Daniel about like, what was it like to show up in this space when it was still maybe under construction? It's like, we've all been there when you're building a restaurant. We kind of like thrive off of that like mm -hmm. chaos, you know? So, you know, I think that like food, yeah, I, I, as an, to be considered an advocate, you know, it's a lot of pressure. Like I, cause I'm still learning about food. I'm still learning about what but Something about is. that fusion of your identity and finding yourself in food, I think, speaks to this notion that the chef isn't just the product of his or her craft, right. but actually puts him or herself into that in a different way, right? right? Yeah, I mean, it's very, you put yourself in a very vulnerable place as a chef because it's kind of like being a musician, right? You get into this as a passion, but then you put it out there for everyone to judge. I mean, you're talking about being number one restaurant in the world. That's a lot of pressure, you know? Like, yeah. you didn't, you weren't. <laughs> But like, you know, you it's have like- you a table you should be at right, right. now? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like you get into it because you like love it. And like, you know, you're a musician because you just want to like play music and, and be artistic. And, but then you kind of get judged. It's such, so subjective. So it's a lot of pressure. And even being, people asking you your thoughts on like, you know, b when I got into the Wasted documentary, right? When they asked me to participate, I was just, dis I didn't know anything about food waste. And I, as a chef, you know, you want to kind of be a know-it-all as a chef. You want to know what you don't know. So I was like, of course I'll participate in this because I don't really know. Like in kitchens, we're trained to not ever waste food, right. you know? So like, but getting to know the facts and the statistics were, it was important to me. It's very important. You guys are just feeding me, if I may, the segues because that brings <laughs> us to, <laughs> that, that helps us pivot this conversation to the actual issue of food waste. And I want to come back after we get there a little bit and talk about the what you just mentioned, the challenge, the gastronomy, the creativity that comes out of uh, limitations. But s set us up a little bit about what's happening in the city and also why there's this uh, American and global push to reduce waste in general and food waste in particular. Well, I mean, so food waste, there's about 1.3 million tons of food that gets wasted in New York City every year. Um, and about half of that's residential and half of that's on the commercial side. And it's a very, it's an environmentally hazardous place to be because that's where all of the greenhouse gases end up being. But it also is an incredible waste of money. 
Um, it's an incredible waste of money for a household. It's an incredible waste of money uh, in a restaurant. If you, that's all profit. You might as well just bag up some dollar bills and you know throw it out the back door. Uh, but what I think is so important about being on the same stage, I don't think that there's been a commissioner of sanitation who's sat with any celebrity <laughs> chefs before. Um, <laughs> yes, you get. Uh, but is it? It's their creativity. It's all of the people think that it's going to be hard that planning out your meals or doing what probably most of our grandmothers did, which was make something on Sunday and recreate it three different ways during the week, uh, is not something that often in our fast-paced world we're thinking about. But I think that when you see chefs who are extraordinarily talented producing, um, you know, I guess number one in the world food from wasted food, you're like, wow, I could actually do that. I could actually be much more efficient and it's so not necessarily driven by the environment or money or just the idea of being creative with how we manage our homes and how restaurants in the city of New York think about what they're doing with food. So this makes everyone else have to step up their game. But you th sorry, yeah, please, Massimo, yes. The, the when we, when I, I called them and uh, I was asking them to create something very simple, very easy, from uh, overripe tomato, brown bananas, uh, you know, uh, breadcrumbs. Uh, I was I was th th thinking about that because that book. I'm 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 I don't want to be too p puts too much emphasis, but to me, it's the most important book in the last 20 years because <laughs> no, well, because it's not his recipe, it's a book so he can say that in which 65 of the most in influential chef in the world they're putting their creativity time thinking about what they can do with, I, I still remember, it, you know, the zucchini, lasagna, you know, he didn't have anything, you know, it was the first day, you know, a little bit of meat, but uh, not too much, uh, and, uh, you know, no pasta, no flour, and, uh, but tons of zucchini, bruised zucchini, and he was slicing the, the zucchini and, and created the lasagna and using zucchini instead of pasta, so these kind of things. All those recipes are so easy going, so fast, you know, that everyone can cook home with that. You know, that book has to stay in the kitchen, take notes, <laughs> and my mama was doing with There's their There's plenty of room for notes in it. I yeah. love that. The yeah, it's yeah, it's like, and change the recipe as you want it. Right. So this is the point. S so I want to talk about something that I think is really important in all of these conversations. At the Beard Foundation, we're working on a curriculum for uh, culinary schools to instill an, a sense of full utilization or minimizing waste. And one of the challenges that we have is the, the phrase itself. When we think of waste, uh, we don't think of things we want to eat. It's not a good word. And I often think of Mary Douglas, the cultural anthropologist, and her great quote that, that dirt is matter out of place and waste is really food out of place in some ways. And so I want to think from a, here both from a cultural anthropological perspective but also from a chef perspective, where do you think that line is about what is not used for reasons of perfection of taste or technique or something you learn to eat the middle chops or, or, or other things and how that, that, that um, spectrum of gastronomy or haute cuisine or whatever it is comes into play when you're thinking about the cooking of food and using everything versus using waste. The main yeah, please, well you Shall can I start? Yeah, please. Um, I think it's it's a very large issue that it's, it's a systemic issue. We are consumers. We are at the end of long supply chains. And now we're used to have food that is available, accessible, and cheap. And so we lose the sense of how important that food is. Uh, I mean, not everybody, unfortunately, but most people in our societies have this access to cheap food. Mm -hmm. And that uh, automatically makes it less less important. And if you go back on the supply chain, you realize that, yes, as consumers or as chefs, we have a huge role in uh, limiting waste. But a lot of waste happens in the distribution, mm -hmm. in the manufacturing, mm -hmm. even on the fields. So right. there is a whole That's way of thinking right. about food that it's all about, you know, in a way, profit, which also means waste. It doesn't matter as long 
money is made. Although, although profit is an imperative, the market is an imperative to at least not to dispo not have any food things end up in landfill in some situation, I would imagine, because you're trying to find money in whatever you can. And as a cook, let's talk about, about approaching a menu or something. Are you thinking about what's left over or not used? Or are you thinking about um, a, a more holistic approach to, to serving your guests and creating your dishes? I mean, for me, I, I, I'm from Switzerland, and I think Switzerland is very good about waste and, and uh, compost and also recycling. I mean, when I go home, I, I cannot agree? believe... Yes, okay, they got yeah, just, <laughs> just checking with the expert, yeah. Okay. In, in fact, um, the, there is the garbage bags. You pay $10 per garbage bag, wow. and they're actually quite small compared to the garbage bags we have here. That's going to go over well here, I think. There's a, there's a <laughs> policy for you. And yeah. so everyone is really thoughtful what yeah. they're putting into them because it's real money. Right. Um, so I'm coming from that background. Like my mom would like, you know, when we eat the yogurt at home, the yogurt is like in the plastic and there's a cardboard label around it and then there's the aluminum on top. So after I eat the yogurt at home, she takes it and she washes it and she takes the cardboard off, puts it on a pile the plastic on a pile and the aluminum on a pile. Even in Naples, they do that. Yeah. Even in Naples. <laughs> hey, well, wow. is that are you throwing shade at Naples? That's no, so... <laughs> <laughs> but did they do that in Oklahoma? No. No, no yeah. definitely not. Right. And that's a question I have. It's like, you know, it, it, it comes from, like, a socioeconomic... Like, I mean, right. I grew up and, like, you're... I, you don't want to pay a lot of money for like a small plate of food. You know, where I grew up, it's like a plate of food is like this big and it's like eight bucks, you know? And like how, I, and it's, it's a, I just struggle with like how do you reprogram or mm -hmm. educate without coming off as being like you're wrong, Please. you know? Like yeah. so, so there, there, there are a few tricks that those people who are in the food business at a slightly lower level. Uh, <laughs> Which is everyone are, else. But uh, is, <laughs> you know, things as simple as change the size of the plate. Right. Um, you know, particularly at all you can eat. Right. We have those in Oklahoma, yeah, of course. right? <laughs> um, uh, places, all of that food goes bad. Tons and yeah, tons of that food. Buffets are one of the buffets most the worst. are the worst. Uh, but for also waste. for waste, yeah, because uh, much of it they're all afraid that they will look like they are going to run out. Right. And the amount and the abundance of food in the United States is astonishing. Well, and we've been trained to see value only in the quantity, not in the 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 reserved elegance. The the, the a, a Japanese person looks at a, a plate of a piece of fish and sees a different sense of value than your Oklahoma neighbors right. growing up. But I mean, would you, so like in Seoul, right, they started charging people for their waste, you know, it, it, could that ever work in Manhattan? Like, that's the real question. Like, I, I was watching in the documentary, I was like, could people, would that ever work here? So I across <laughs> the United, I just, I wanna ask across the United States, the election actually, was most people <laughs> pay for waste, and so we are exploring. Actually, the mayor put it in the one NYC before the election yeah. uh, about how do we incentivize recycling and reduce waste. Uh, so we are thinking about it. In a rental world, it's much tougher than in a homeowner world. Rental ho ho uh, homes, rental apartments. You rental mean. apartments. Oh, right. Yes, oh, interesting. because the they're not. Are not the yes, people. they're oh. not. Who? Where's oh, the incentive falling? Um, but yeah, we are thinking about how you might accomplish right. that in a vertical city like New York City with this type of density. Um, but we are focused first on giving them also different opportunities, both for uh, recycling as well as for the ability to compost at the curb. You know, right. we have 3.3 million New Yorkers who can have their compost picked up at the curb, right. which really is that's impressive. Right. Yeah. Big. Bigger than anyone else. Well. I think. I think one thing I want to add, um, and I really believe that I, I feel the the magic of cooking is to create like a consommé. Like a consommé is made out of, nothing. out of nothing. It's a pile of bones that will get thrown away, and I think that is really um, the magic of cooking, because it's not about just selecting the greatest ingredients and barely touch it and put it on the plate. That's not really, for me. of course, right. that's an element that we all uh, do as well. But I think the most exciting part is like how you make a sauce, how you make a right. stock. Um, so I, I think when we plan a menu, we try to balance, we try to balance that. Even, even like my mom used to, you know, I, I grew up in a middle class family 
and my mom would use to buy like two chickens uh, on a Wednesday or so. And then she would, uh, you know, make the livers over a salad on Thursday. And then, you know, the whole roasted chicken was like on Sunday, but mm -hmm. then maybe make a broth for, for the next week. So so when, when we do a meal, we also right now we're working on a dish um, with scallops and in the winter the scallops are just amazing here. But but we're we're also trying to serve another course where we're using the trims of the scallops, making a broth, making a butter. Um, so so we're trying to kind of compensate for that and, and it's of course there's waste at Eleven Madison and I'm sure at, at all other restaurants. But but it's also about it's also about teaching the people a little bit to um, that that you can make something out of nothing almost. Mm -hmm. We have um, yeah. in um, in Austria, you know, uh, I'm from Modena. No, in the, in Modena is in the middle of the food valley, so we grew up with this kind of mentality. And um, uh, when ma when uh, the farmers uh, they're like killing an animal, they explain that uh, is a, a very spiritual act uh, because uh, uh, you know is the animal is a part of the family and is giving his life to feed uh, the family so you have to use every single bones uh, of that animal so uh, growing up like this you know we we reproduce exactly the same way the same attitude in the restaurant and we have this kind of exercise who are you, where you come from, uh, and uh, every single stagiaire, they're coming from all over the world, they have to express themselves, you know, and with all the scraps and the things and the cuts and the bones and, uh, and the uh, things that we are left in the preparation in Osteria, you know, they have to make the staff meal. Mm -hmm. And we are serving uh, uh, 30 people every lunch and every dinner, but we are 60 uh, to prepare. So it's like 120, meals uh, every day right. so it's like uh, we have to engine ourselves uh, even for the uh, you know the balance at the end right. of the year you but know. that in itself is a part of the training I would imagine absolutely right. is, a, is the most difficult thing right. you know uh, and it's part of uh, what you can do use your imagination the creativity and uh, all the technique uh, we have uh, to to create uh, amazing food and that's how we start uh, without Osiri Francescana and the example in Osiri Francescana, I could never, uh, and, and of course the heritage of my parents, you know, I could never ever think about to create something like that at the Universal Exposition. Amazing. Yeah. Fabio, yes. Uh, I, I just think also that uh, teaching and learning how to uh, waste less when it comes to food, it's sort of an exercise to start and, and think about how to waste less in other parts of our life. Right. So uh, last week we had somebody from the EU uh, came to talk to us and he explained to us that they are trying to use food waste sort of as entry key mm. to educate people about sustainability in general and even more about the concept of circular economy which has become a priority in the EU. So how do you uh, turn the uh, output of a process into the input for something else, so that you reduce waste at all system, levels. Through the system. And he said, we decided to start working on food waste because it's something that people experience mm. personally in their homes. And that might help them think about also larger mm. issues. So I think in this sense, what you guys are doing as chefs, it's really stimulating also this way of thinking, you know, right. creating examples. But think right. about the companies like uh, Grunding or like Sub-Zero. They are creating uh, uh, machines uh, and dishwashers and um, washing machines. They use uh, less water than ever. And, uh, you know, that's why they approach us after the old things and the universal exposition. We want to support Food for Soul because we are working in the same way you are working with food. So the less water, the less electricity, you know, it's like, right. it's movement, it's real, you know, it's here. So uh, two final things, and then I think we have the questions. I hope you filled out your cards and that they will find their way to me soon. Um, I want to ask about the nature of, um, of creativity when it comes to food and and the role, let's get back to the role that chefs play, because I think it's one thing for me to say, oh, my mother, 
um, was was very um, frugal in the kitchen, if, if your mother even was ever in the kitchen, and these days that's less <laughs> and less true, but and didn't do these things, or you have a tradition of Italy or Switzerland to draw on. And another thing to say, that the greatest chefs in the world tell me this is something I should pay attention to, and this food is as good for Daniel Hum and Massimo and Danny as it is for uh, me, uh, my, you know, a New Yorker, uh, someone who goes to the green market and, and prides myself on knowing things about food, and I can know that. And so I want to talk about a little bit the inspiration that you can give and, and, and get back to that where we started, the role of the chef and how that's changed, and, and what you would say to people um, who are, don't have your skills, but also want to be good citizens and, and participate in the circular economy. Do you have advice for folks? How can they engage? To me, the best recipe that we can do and we can transfer to you is um, eat seasonal. Find a way to meet the people that are used to, uh, you know, where you used to go and, uh, you know, small stores or old food or whatever. You know, wherever you go, like the, the guy they are serving you is going to always give you the best piece, the best things, or the best. But eat seasonal. Buy, try to find the half an hour every three, every two, three days to buy fresh food, live in the refrigerator, and cook that. You know, you're going to save money, you're going to eat better, and you don't going to waste anything. And you stimulate your creativity with the food you have bought, like the day before. I think this is the best uh, recipe. Anything to add? Have. That sounds like a complete recipe. Do you guys have anything <laughs> to add? No, for for me it's tough. I, I think at home it's difficult because I think using waste it requires a little bit more thinking because maybe you're you know you're at home on the weekend and then you work all week and by the time you. I want to ask you something. Yeah. Do you feel we were cooking waste? Or we were cooking ordinary ingredients in well, at the universal. Not waste, well. yeah, ordinary ingredients. I would say. for me too. Yeah, you know, it's like is yes. th those are yeah, the no, exactly right. the ingredients yeah, right. we yeah. were like. I remember the you know the 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 Japanese pavilion once. You know, but you, you you know you send like uh, all these ingredients. Are they, you know these are not waste. No. These are. Ordinary ingredients. Well, yeah. So that's why you have to change. That's part of changing yeah. the perspective and the yeah, vocabulary. Yeah, that's yeah. the change. A ripe banana isn't garbage. It's what a ripe what banana <laughs> with spots yeah. on it, and it's that's no. when it's good. Actually, but listen, <laughs> uh, you know, Mitchell Davis, uh, um, uh, Mitchell, um, 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 uh, what's uh, Enrique Olvera, ask me, ask me to prepare brown bananas, but brown bananas, you know. And then at the Universal Exposition, we we learn how to use the banana peel as transform as a chutney or like the brown bananas that are like perfect like uh, matching for the main course or like um, making a sorbet with uh, all these banana without ev even using the sugar so it's like it's it's unbelievable you know one one of the gr some of the greatest dishes of t of the past especially i think in italian cuisine are are results of 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 waste or or right. yeah or, or like and like when I'm thinking as I'm sitting here it's like these traditional dishes is that still happening is there traditional like well they they you guys have now taken over the traditional dishes you went f restaurants went from being the places you got the untraditional things to being the places where you preserve <laughs> the I think it's yeah, a big yeah, change yeah, right yeah. so you I, it would have been hard to have been I don't know Escoffier and served uh, his mother's Fermented pickles. I, I don't know. Right. What that means. That's why. That's why. Uh, the other week, uh, I was in Paris <laughs> to have a meeting with all these three-star Michelin chef. You know, French chef. They talk like this. <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, I was like, <laughs> I was, I was just. We were down in the kitchen <laughs> in Ducasse place. And, you know, Yannick Aleno was there, like Pierre Gagnier, Ducasse, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, they were like... Blah, 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 blah. And they were listening to me. You know, and I was like, can you imagine in Paris, Place de la Madeleine, so incredible for you, for Paris, for French, you, three-star Michelin, you're cooking for migrants and things. And Ducasse was like looking at me like Get this. Get this crazy and Italian like, out of here. I can't <laughs> believe an Italian chef is putting together whole houses like this is crazy this is revolutionary i said okay. yes it is 
So we've got some, some questions from the audience, uh, some good ones too. So, um, someone asked, what's the single most wasted ingredient in restaurants and in homes today? Is that something, do we know? Uh, there's been some uh, surveys done of like kitchen diaries and things like that. It tends to be what you would expect, skin, stalks. Uh, people want the top of the broccoli. They don't want the stalk of the broccoli. Right. Uh, when so organic waste almost. Organic right. waste is, right. and leftovers. In my house, Anything I think is it's leftovers. bread. Bread. Me too. Yeah. Me too. I think bread. Bread, bread is gold, the book Bread says. too. Yeah. yeah. That's why. Yeah. So let's tell, say a little bit about yeah. that. Bread, yeah. uh, bread is, uh, you know, we prepare bread and we bake bread uh, uh, maybe five times uh, a day to have always the bread mm. uh, to serve Fresh. the bread just baked. And we uh, at the end of the day, we have a lot of breads. And if you think about, you know, the one of the most important, you know, very simple, easy recipe that my daughter loves, you know, uh, is like breadcrumbs. Is noodle made with breadcrumbs, uh, eggs, and uh, Parmigiano Reggiano. Make very, very quick uh, some uh, nutmeg, a mm. little bit, and uh, you squeeze into a chicken broth. And it's one of the most amazing plates. And uh, just to, you know, to, uh, to, to use the, the bread leftover there, bread. Right. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting question, too. How can restaurants change the behavior or the perception of food waste? Uh, for their guests without making it the center of attention. So I'm going to let them answer yeah. it, but I think that anyone who's going into one of their restaurants already thinks that everything on their plate is fabulous before they right. probably had it. Um, At three hundred dollars for dinner, not a lot goes. Back. I'm going to I'm going to assume that they're going right. to eat all of their food. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's an important thing, and we deal with this in, in some of our advocacy work with chefs, where at the Beard Foundation we're trying to fire chefs up to be politically active and participate. But at the same time, uh, I mean, if you'll pardon the pun, you can't really stuff something down someone's throat who come into your restaurant for an experience that may have nothing to do with your po political moment, but that doesn't mean you don't have an opportunity there to do something or to influence someone in some like, way. Like, I don't want to say 90%, but 75% uh, of the people that come to the restaurant and I meet them, they all congratulate, of course, for the meal, but also for the project. So they know the project. So this is the way we can act. We can act, they know, they have to know, and they know that we are like involved in this kind of project, and they, they really care. A lot of people really care, and I feel it. Well, you you're know? very convincing. I have to say. <laughs> uh, but I think... No, no, it's time. It's time. Yeah, it's no, the right course, time. No. It was the right time. I think one thing has happened a lot in the last 10 years probably is that, like Massimo said, ordinary ingredients versus waste. I, I think we chefs have all had signature dishes made uh, from carrots or cauliflower or mm -hmm. who knows what. You know, like uh, ingredients that before you would have not would have not been acceptable in a restaurant that mm -hmm. a meal is like three hundred dollars right um, and today I think it is and I think that is also a change like people don't need only the highest end products anymore we, we, we I think we are able to teach the audience that that a carrot can be as luxurious as, mm -hmm. as caviar or but but because uh, uh, something happened at the at the at the end of the 90s and the beginning of the the, the new, <coughs> you know, in the Ferran broke all these barriers. Ferran and Adria. Ferran Adria, Del Bulli, yeah, Del Bulli he, he teach us mm, that uh, cuisine can be much more than, uh, you know, uh, uh, some lobster or caviar or foie gras. And uh, could be more, much more emotional. And uh, a sardine, and I was talking and discussing about this with... Uh, uh, Giro uh, uh, three days ago, and the sardine can be much more emotional than something farm raised uh, somewhere, you know, you know, and these kind of things like chewing a Parmigiano Reggiano crust uh, or carrots or things is something emotional. So cuisines move to a different level, mm -hmm. so to emotional level. I, I want to ask because I. There are a hundred people tonight at Eleven Madison Park, mm -hmm. and how many people at in Modena having dinner? Thirty. Th Thirty, and how many? Four hundred tonight. Okay, so let's talk about scale. There's if no one at my house. Right. No, <laughs> <laughs> mine either. <laughs> 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 but 
<laughs> so what you guys are doing is amazing, and you certainly have an audience, and you can do anything for them because of who you are and because of what you stand for. Let's, talk, let's move the conversation outside a little bit, that rarefied world, and talk about scale, and talk about what, what we can learn from this that brings us down to the all-you-can-eat buffet at the bodega on the corner or, or whatever it is, and, and how might we um, use this enthusiasm, this passion, and this, this p uh, political will to, to help, if you'll pardon the world, trickle down um, and, and onto the, to the pe real people? Um, in, in the dearest sense. In the dearest yeah. sense, the ones, maybe someday they'll all be at your restaurants. But uh, I think one of the things that I would say is the fact that all of the chefs here not only thinking about food and food waste, but bringing joy to food um, and to the experience of having the communal meal, which I think is one of the reasons why in Oklahoma they're treating food as something just to consume rather than that it's an experience. That was certainly part of the refectorial project. Right, was is, the the is, the of is the community of it. Um, and so that needs to trickle down as well as just the practical. I mean, there are things that are, that are challenging for restaurants in the city of New York. Uh, what are the rules from the health department? What can you give away um, that you don't use? So we've been trying to do a lot of education and then also inspire people by doing, we're about to give out micro grants to small businesses to say what are your ideas about how this could work in the world of the bodega, in the world of the lunch counter. Um, but I don't think you get there unless chefs are saying this is doable. This is a I completely see. doable thing and it also we, we do push that it can save them money um, right. because profit is always an issue, particularly for our small businesses in the city of New York. Right. I, I just want to mention uh, another way of doing all this and give an example is like Jose Andres and what he does in Haiti and all the things. So it's like there are so many ways you can do or you can, uh, you know, help and uh, Sad example. Well, I also have the regulatory authority to make require them to do it. So, <laughs> 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 well, and uh, using that authority for these sorts of issues, I think, is has not always been a priority, but certainly is now. Mm -hmm. And under you, we're grateful. And for I that. do think there is a lot of room for collaboration between, I don't know, the sanitation department, chefs, but also maybe designers. I think uh, since f eating, it's a total experience. Maybe there are other ways of designing the flow of how people move or how food is served or th the communication around dishes through, I don't know, images or the menu. I don't know. Uh, this is right, something that is- Piling it to the ceiling and, and saying, you know, all you can eat, whatever, blah, blah, exactly. blah. Right. So there, there could be ways to, to work around this through good design. And this is just a possibility. I think the, the opportunities for collaborations are, are huge. Uh, and this is an example, the conversations we're having, I think, point to that. Right. So Massimo, your idea which started uh, in reaction to a little fair that was happening in Milan has grown really into a global movement. Um, and I think we should spend a few minutes talking about the projects that you are working on and have worked on in Rio, in London, and other parts so that people understand how it's really catching fire. Yeah, it's like uh, after Milan, uh, you know, we, we realized that we did something very important, but uh, not 100%. Till one morning, uh, we received a message from uh, the mayor of Rio de Janeiro. It was 6 in the morning, and, uh, you know, we were in bed, uh, me and Lara, and, uh, and the ding, ding, you know, I, I look at the WhatsApp and it was, um, I'm your biggest fan and I would love to have you in Rio de Janeiro for the Olympics and, uh, you know, and I was like, why not? I answered. <laughs> and I was like, who has that? Well, the mayor of Rio wants the ref at all. No, eh? No, no. Y yes, let's do it. And uh, so we immediately, we, we create Food for Soul, this uh, foundation that, uh, in which we use uh, my image to to raise money and uh, to use to open a refectorio. There are like um, this uh, soup kitchen um, in which uh, you know they're permanent. Uh, we involve uh, um, uh, communities and we involve artists, as I explained. So I called uh, friends in as Vic Munitz, 
uh, beautiful artist and uh, the Campanas brother to create that and uh, you know uh, we did the Rio de Janeiro and the point the really key point was when uh, when a journalist from the New York Times came and uh, you know he saw everything you know he was interview all these people there was they are very they were very difficult from, were very different from Milan because these are in Rio they were uh, people like they living on the street like um, you know, 2.5 million people are living on the street in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, 11 trucks full of uh, vegetable and fruit are burned every day, every day. 11 big trucks. So it th is insane. Brazilians was insane. It was the most difficult experience that I'm sure Burkina Faso is going to be much easier than uh, Rio de Janeiro. And... Uh, and then uh, it was uh, the, the in the in the article, you know, he was interviewed this guy uh, with uh, his wife, and um, they said uh, at the end of the uh, the article was, uh, you know, they they answer it is the first time they treat us like human being, and uh, I was pin I was asking my wife to pinch myself, and uh, because uh, we were treated like prince and princess. And um, from that moment, you know, on the New York Times, expanded all over the world, and, uh, you know, we had all the television and the things that were in line to, to ask uh, and to see and to what was going on. After Rio, uh, the city of Modena, you know, you uh, ask it to open uh, one there, another in Bologna. And the 5th of June, we opened London. London uh, was the easiest one, you know, maybe because uh, the mentality, maybe because uh, the things. But you know, all these people, like, since day one, they understood the, the quality of the project. And, uh, you know, there was, this, um, there was this old lady, uh, 92 years old. Uh, she came uh, and to me and she asked for a microphone. And uh, she said, uh, can I speak? I said, of course you can. And I gave the microphone and she said, you know, guys, I just want to say thank you to these people you know, for the most amazing things they did. This is the most beautiful place I ever seen, and uh, it's gonna create community, and now I can die very happy. You know, everyone was like crying and <laughs> things, and was like, but she got it immediately, since day one. Mm -hmm. You know, she saw the space, she had the perception, and she felt it, you know, that was. So, so we're not talking about food waste here. Exactly, right? We're talking, uh, I mean we've so. mentioned community, you've yeah. used the word dignity, nice there's, something, there's something more systemic that I think That's this project means. That's why I say right? it's, not, it's not a charity project. Right. This is a cultural project, you know, to change the mind of the people. Right. You know? uh, first is like fighting waste. Second, transfer our knowledge to all the volunteers and uh, all over, and, the, and the through books and uh, you know, the film and documentary through the mind of uh, all the people that are ready to learn and to understand this kind of uh, changing of mentality. And then third, you know, it's even for us, because uh, as I said to Daniel that since day one, you know, I said, Daniel, you come and you'll see you're going to receive much more than what you're going to give. And it's true, because, you know, we all very move and very into the project. Well, I think that's a beautiful place to stop. I think, I think w uh, and I'll remind people that Massimo will be signing the book, and I'm sure Danielle might, and Danny, and I'll sign it, but you don't want my signature. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, th the title, Bread is Gold, is really about transformation, right? We're ta it's about the topic of, of um, semantics and, and the words we use and the power that those words have. And in fact, we really mean breadcrumbs and, and stale bread and, and all of that is also gold here. And I thank you for showing that to us in such a profound way for everyone who participates in a, in a daily way in dealing with the issue. And, and I would encourage all of you uh, not just to buy the book, but to think about what it means to bring uh, dignity to and respect to the food, to the people, and to everybody um, who deserves to eat as well as these guys can cook. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much.